All right, Dr. Kim, and it looks like we've got 20 some of our friends with us. I think we can go ahead and have you start. And then uh, as people join, we'll just uh, continue to welcome okay. them. In. Okay, well, good morning. Uh, my name is Ed Kinman. I'm a faculty member at Longwood University, uh, teaching geography and environmental science. Also located not more, I mean, less than one mile from the event behind me uh, in which the uh, students at the Moton School uh, went on strike back in 1951 to protest the unequal uh, situations between the uh, black and the white high school. So welcome to this speaker series. Uh, this is a partnership with the Virginia Geographic Alliance, along with the New American History Project, um, with support uh, from Christopher Newport University. And I want to thank each one of those for their input uh, and particularly give a shout out to, to Kelly Rosen, who is uh, making all of this magic of uh, bringing us together to be able to focus in on these type of topics uh, uh, together today. So thank you, Kelly, Kelly excuse me, uh, for your help in this. I also would like to give thanks to Shannon uh, Costello as well as uh, one of the visionaries to help to put this whole thing together. So Shannon, I'll give it over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce you guys to our speaker, who is Miss Annie Evans. Annie is a National Geographic Society Grosvenor Teacher Fellow, a Nat Geo Certified Educator and Trainer, and a Co-Coordinator of the Virginia Geographic Alliance. With over 30 years of classroom and educational leadership experience, she designs curriculum and facilitates professional learning for K through 16 teachers and museum educators, focusing on historical thinking skills, geo-literacy, instructional coaching, project-based learning, and performance assessments. Ms. Evans serves on the History and Social Science Steering Committee for the Virginia Department of Education, the Governor's Commission on African American History Education, and the Board of Directors for the Center for the Teaching the Rule of Law. Currently, Ms. Evans is the Director of Education and Outreach for New American History at the University of Richmond, and it is the work resulting from her many partnerships that she will share with you all today. So without further ado, I give you Ms. Annie Evans. Thank you so much, Dr. Kimmon and Ms. Costello. And I do also wanna give a shout out to Kylie Rawson at CNU for all of her assistance with behind the scenes tech support. Um, we really value all the partnerships. Uh, new American History is a fairly new project out of the University of Richmond, uh, where I'm based now. And it's because of partnerships with strong organizations like the Virginia Geographic Alliance, partnering with other universities like UVA and CNU, um, as well as many others of uh, Virginia Humanities. Um, so some of the projects and work that we're gonna see today is a really good example of scholars collaborating with one another. Many of you who are in this session today, I think were also with us last week when Dr. John Finn, from CNU led an amazing presentation on his original scholarship, looking into renlining and racial inequality in the Newport News Hampton Roads area. So today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at um, some of the digital scholarship out of the University of Richmond that Dr. Finn referenced. Um, specifically, he talked about mapping inequality, which was a nationwide redlining uh, mapping project that uh, over a period of several years, the Digital Scholarship Lab here at U of R um, researched and digitized thousands of original records from the Homeowners Loan Corporation. There's a bit.ly on the screen here, and I believe Ms. Costello is gonna put this bit.ly into the chat. Um, what I really hope is that you will copy that bit.ly and that you will open your um, device, have one tab open with Zoom and then another tab open with the slides that I'm presenting because I want you to kind of follow along. I want this to be very participatory. Um, I want you to be able to ask questions. Ms. Costello is going to monitor the chat and she will periodically uh, stop me and tell me if there's something that we need to address or if people aren't understanding what we're doing because I want these maps and the, this research to be something that you can take with you and use 
um, not just to study for a test. My goal is not for you to pass a test. I know that the AP teachers sitting there probably aren't happy that I just said that, but um, the test is great and it's, it's a way for some of you to earn college uh, credit before you uh, leave high school, which is all great and wonderful. But more importantly, I want you to get out of this is the, um, the, the research and the understanding that impacts your communities. And this impacts all of our communities. Um, so it's more important for me today that you kind of look at the big picture and see patterns and understand that the actions and decisions made by citizens like us and also by our elected officials continue to have lasting impacts on us today. Um, and that you as future leaders and voters, you're going to be making some of those decisions for us moving forward in the very near future. And what I'm hoping is that your generation will make better decisions perhaps than mine or our previous generations did. That's really my goal today. So I'm gonna come out of presenter mode because um, I wanna make sure that you are all um, able to get to the slides and see them. Um, and periodically we will go out to the live slides sites as well. Um, you've already heard more than you need to about me. So this is the project that kind of started it all off. This is redlining Richmond. And very much like Dr. Finn's presentation last week, um, this original project, project kind of just focused on um, our immediate neighborhood, our surroundings, which was the Richmond city uh, and surrounding suburbs. And so when these um, homeowners loan corporation maps were kind of rediscovered in the Library of Congress, uh, they quickly became you know, a topic that scholars were looking at. And um, so the folks at U of R began the process of digitizing. And that took a very long time, as you can imagine. There were also cartographers and scholars from Virginia Tech and Johns Hopkins University. So again, this, this whole scholarly collaboration, it's not just one university or one group of um, historians working on this project. But um, while they were kind of looking into this uh, large body of um, documents and maps and, and information, they started off small by digitizing Richmond. So the redlining Richmond uh, map is still live. It's still available. I know many of you logging in are from the Richmond area. Um, Ms. Costello teaches in Chesterfield. And so, but we do have folks logging in from across the state and even a few other parts of the country today. So, um, while I'm going to show some of the work focusing on Richmond, we're also going to look big picture into um, some of the other projects. So starting off small with redlining Richmond, you can see similar patterns to what Dr. Finn shared with you last week about the Newport News Hampton Roads area. You see these redlined neighborhoods. Um, you see the uh, security map has been overlaid along with the GIS where they've georeferenced each individual section and digitized that. Um, and labeled those. So it's very similar to the project that you saw last week. But if we go out to the larger map, this is mapping inequality. And so I'm gonna attempt to um, go out to the live map. Hopefully it's gonna behave. Ms. Costello, are you still seeing my screen? Yes, I am. Okay, I just wanna make sure. Sometimes when I'm in presenter mode, Zoom doesn't like me. So this is the... Um, Mapping inequality, which is part of our digital atlas at the University of Richmond, which is called American Panorama. And I will show you how to get to that and navigate to that a little bit later. But this is the map that shows all of the digitized um, Hulk redlining maps and original source documents that are available to you and to scholars all across the country and across the world. This is by far the largest project in our new American history family. This website received its 1 millionth hit in July, I believe. Towards the end of July, we received our millionth hit, which means well over a million people now have logged in and examined these documents through this map. Uh, and what you see here is these concentric circles and they are color coded to match that um, key that Dr. Finn shared with you last week. For those of you who logged in, you can, uh, change the way that you're looking at these circles back and forth. And there's a nice explanation here. You can do it um, switching between the different types of markers, but I'm gonna go ahead and stay with more, more of the bullseye because I think it really illustrates population. And so some kids were asking why certain cities were not represented. And so the, the short answer is at the time during the New Deal era, 
Um, only cities with 40,000 people or more were considered worth their time, so to speak, to go to all the trouble to map this out and to um, pay realtors and local government officials to go out into the neighborhoods and assess and rate each of these places. So while we could go down to Norfolk like Dr. Finn did, um, we could certainly do that, or we could make it more local. We could go to Richmond, Virginia. I also want to make sure that you guys had um, kind of the bigger picture today, um, looking across. So if we could use the chat, and Ms. Castello, if you could help me out, because when I'm in presenter mode, I can't really see the chat. But I'm wondering what the students who are with us today, what kind of patterns are you noticing? What are you seeing that's there? And, and maybe more importantly, what's not there? Just by looking at the map from your first glance. What do you notice? And Ms. Costello, you'll have to read them to me because I won't be able to. Are they able to type into the chat today? I would hope so. Ms. Rossing, can you check on that for us to make sure? They, they are, I just okay. um, enabled right. it, so. Okay. So what are you noticing? What are we seeing on the map? What patterns are we seeing? Natalie said most of the circles are near the East Coast. Mm, a good many of them. We've got a few large cities like Los Angeles over here, um, some up in the Pacific Northwest area closer to Seattle. But you're right, a lot, a lot of that is um, because at the time and even now, large population density along the Great Lakes and in the Northeast for sure. Um, we, we have larger cities are near the water. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So we know historically water was not just a nice view, um, but it was transportation and it was resources. Anything else? What are we not noticing? Where, where are we not seeing a lot of circles? Um, Ashley said that the big, the larger the city, the bigger the circle. Absolutely, absolutely. New so England positive. looks like, yeah. Caleb Contreras said New, England's, New England looks like it has the most areas in the A rating. Mm -hmm. Good observations. What about Wyoming and Montana and the Dakotas and Idaho? What are we noticing there? There's a lack of circles in mountainous areas, mm. Chris is telling Ooh, us. Nice, except for Salt Lake City and Denver. But yeah, yeah, good, good catch. Okay, I think you guys are starting to kind of see the some of these patterns emerging. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of walk us through a city. Um, and because she's been so wonderful to us, Kylie, I'm gonna ask you to pick a city that you see here on the map that you would like us to explore as a little thank you Ooh. to helping uh -huh. us. <laughs> um, let's go with Detroit. Thank you, all right. So um, hopefully I click the right one, okay. Yes, so what you're seeing here on the screen on the right is the original scanned historic Hulk map. And on the left, what we've done uh, at the University of Richmond is we have transcribed all of what you would normally see both on the map, the demographic information. Um, remember the grading system that Dr. Finn shared with us last week. So green would be the best, considered the best. This, these would be your as my sister used to say, the fancy neighborhoods. Um, and then blue would still be considered good upper middle class, you know, kind of the where regular people live as, as I would say when I was a kid. And then yellow would be what Hulk called definitely declining. And Dr. Finn pointed out, and we'll, we'll look at some examples of the annotations that were made by the realtors and the local officials who filled out the forms that accompany these maps. Um, and then red, which is where this term redlining again comes from, red were the, the areas that were um, considered not a good risk in terms of lending and um, steering people away from moving into those areas or not making investments in improvements in those areas. So if you look over here on the left, we've got what are these area descriptions. And these come from um, the original scan documents um, that were part of this Homeowners Loan Association the demographic information. Um, so if we were to, to search one of these, 
we can show the original document. We can zoom in on that. And Dr. Finn had a few screenshots of that, but now you can access literally for any city that was mapped out as part of that program. You can zoom in on that city, just like we had Kylie Rostin pick Detroit. You can pick whatever part of the country you wanna explore, and then you can show the scan and you can zoom in. So taking a look at these descriptions, remember you've also got them over here on the left side typed out. Um, but they talk about a small area of obsolete houses, definitely out of place in this location. Um, so as you scroll through different areas of the map, you can toggle back and forth, you can show the map, you can click on areas, here's a blue area, you can show the scan, you can kind of look at the demographics, you can look at the descriptions. Um, here they reference the cheapness of the new construction. That's why they gave it a B rating maybe instead of a, a, a green or a higher rating. Um, you can go through, remember Dr. Finn talked about some of the language which nowadays we would consider very inappropriate. I would have considered inappropriate back then had I lived during that time, but um, you know, referring to it as infiltration, um, looking at, uh, antiquated terms like Negro. So again, we want to be sensitive when we're looking at this scholarship and research and talking about it, knowing that there's terminology embedded in these documents that many of us would find, or we all should find offensive now, but we've got to put that in that historical perspective. Um, so if you go back, uh, you can scroll through and you can look at this, all of the demographic information, and we're going to kind of do an updated version of this. So I want to make sure you know how to find the original uh, information for any of these places um, are going to be over here on the left with these transcribed documents and then you can go back out to the map. So I'm going to go back out to the larger map here. Are there any questions about kind of how to get in and find things on the map? Miss Castello in the chat. Not right now, but I okay. did I put a reminder. Don't forget they can you guys can use the chat, but you could also use the Q&A function as well. Great. All right, so we've, we've got the scan documents. You can click on each of them and read the descriptions. You can read the demographic information. Um, and I, I wanna kind of point out that uh, one of the things that Dr. Finn talked about, and I believe we're gonna try and do a future session in this speaker series that speaks more directly and into more depth on um, the activities that we saw this summer across the country, but specifically here in Richmond in our own backyard about the Confederate monuments. And, and Dr. Finn mentioned that, um, you know, some of the uh, real estate practices back during the 30s and 40s, all the way through the 50s, 60s, and even today, um, certain neighborhoods were marketed as exclusive. And were this practice of redlining was a way to uh, for realtors to steer potential clients towards certain parts of the city to make housing sales. So this is an article that I've uh, linked in the presenter notes. So if you haven't discovered the presenter notes, um, hopefully you took that bit.ly and you've got those slides and Ms. Costello can put that again in the chat for those of you that might have logged in a little bit late. Um, this article appeared in a magazine called The Atlantic um, this past June and it talked about how Monument Avenue, specifically in Richmond, um, was a selling point. They were specifically used to sell this whole idea of segregated or separate neighborhoods. And um, in the article, which you can explore later on your own, um, but I've just enlarged in a little excerpt of it, they talk about how they reassured potential buyers through what were called restrictive covenants that no lot could ever be sold or rented in Monument Avenue Park, which is a neighborhood that was just off of Monument Avenue to any person of African descent. That was literally written into the housing contracts. They used it in advertising. They used it as a way to lure in um, prospective wealthier homeowners to purchase properties in these types of neighborhoods. Um, and we think of this as, oh, well, that was in the olden days. That happened back before we were born. Um, people don't really do that anymore, but that's not entirely true. So um, I want to go to this next slide, and I want to make this a little larger so you can read it. This is an actual advertisement that appeared in the 19, I believe, 13, uh, newspaper in, here in Richmond, 
And when this neighborhood, Monument Avenue Park, was being developed and sold, uh, you notice that these are excerpts down here in the bottom of the ad, and I've blown them up for you, and the red brackets are to kind of draw your attention, similar to some of the language that were in those Hulk documents. So I want you to take a moment and zoom in either on your own device if you're following along the slides of the bit.ly or hopefully you can see it on the screen, I've made it large enough. But what, what kind of language or what jumps out at you? And you can put that in the chat and Ms. Costello can let me know. What are we seeing in these ads that is shocking or that by today's standards you would think we would not allow? Any thoughts in the chat, Ms. Costello? I don't see anything yet, but I would like to point out what shocked me was in that the center one, the large one, where it talks about those people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, here's a couple of people coming in. Ashley is saying the discrimination of color, they restricted people of color to be able to buy a house in this neighborhood. Josie Crump, there are restrictions in the ad which would not be in modern day ads. Um, Natalie said, no African-Americans are allowed to be sold or rented lots on Monument Avenue Park. Uh, Chris pointed out restrictions, no lots can ever be sold. So the, the permanence of that statement. Yep. How about the one in the middle? Is there anything interesting that pops out in that middle excerpt that I've got for you here? What are those selling points or what is it that they're trying to use to attract people? Abigail said that they're saying that Richmond will be better. Better than what? Right? Mm -hmm. Good one, Abigail. Better than what? Or where? I do want to direct your attention here where it talks about many thousands of dollars have been spent laying sidewalks, setting out shade trees, grading streets, etc. Because that's going to come back. So I want you to remember that now, kind of tuck that away. Um, and again, you've got links to the original sources where I found all of this in your presenter notes. So you can take time later on to explore some of those. Um, but kind of keep the this in mind. So knowing that redlining was going on um, in the 30s and 40s when these Hulk maps were made, a second piece of scholarship that's related to this, this idea um, came along in the 50s and 60s. And again, this is before I was born. Um, so I'm pretty sure most people on this call were also before they were born, or I was a very young baby towards the tail end of this. Um, but this is our second map, which is called Renewing Inequality. And here they took the original redlined maps. Uh, you can see here, and we're gonna go out to live site in a moment. So what we've done is we've taken um, the original redlining maps from the Mapping Inequality Project that we just looked at. And then we are looking at what was called urban renewal. And so if you think about those ads we just looked at where they were starting to develop new properties in the earlier part um, in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, now we're looking at some of those neighborhoods, um, especially the red and yellow neighborhoods have fallen into dis disrepair and they aren't, um, they are now starting to impact the sellability of some of the blue and green neighborhoods that they are connected to. And cities are trying to, uh, are constantly trying to attract new businesses and attract new development and having neighborhoods that are not cared for and are not kept up to code are um, not good ways to attract new business and new development. And so our, once again, our federal government went into this uh, practice called urban renewal. And if you think about the big circles that were on the original map, the larger cities like Los Angeles, 
and Chicago and others that we looked at, certainly New York. Um, but it also happened in smaller cities like Richmond um, and Charlottesville. So while I'm, I live outside of Charlottesville, although I work at University of Richmond now, and I used to teach in Richmond, but Charlottesville was not in the original um, Hulk maps, uh, but we were included in this urban renewal map. So again, we're gonna go out to um, mapping, in, excuse me, renewing inequality, which is our second map that we're gonna look at. And you should be able to just click on that link like I am and follow along. Just a little something about these maps. Um, this introductory page that you'll see on the majority of the maps, we didn't have it on the mapping inequality because that map just got a big refresh. Um, we are constantly adding new um, details to that map, but you want to always take a look at these um, images and the short description of the maps. And this is my favorite section of most of our maps that have this how to use this map section um, because it kind of helps you interpret the map. So don't just click next and enter. I know we tend to do that in the digital world and not really read things, but I think that um, giving yourself a moment to look at how to use this map and the different types of tools on the map will make a better experience for you. So uh, for instance, here it kind of explains how the circles, similar to the other one, the bigger the circle, the larger the impact, the number of people, the size of the communities that were being um, improved or bulldozed over as we're going to look at in a moment and then looking um, at over the years using these bar graphs and you'll be able to, to see those um, and then looking at the different details about how many families are going to be displaced you're going to see all of that in the map and i think looking at the tools is a really important skill and you don't want to just click through or click past the, those types of things too quickly um, so you'll notice that this, this has some similarities to the map that we just looked at with mapping inequality, um, and that's not uh, by mistake, that is by design. Uh, and so the very talented Nate Ayers, who works with us at the Digital Scholarship Lab, he takes the original GIS that you may be familiar with looking at, uh, which is more similar to what Dr. Finn showed you last week, and then he kind of puts this extra layer of design element over it. So those of you who are art students, as well as geography students that are with us today, that might be something to think about, you know, kind of the artistry behind the cartography here. But again, these big circles, Chicago, New York, Philly, um, Baltimore, Washington, DC. Washington, DC was not included in the original Hulk redlining maps, um, but they are included here in what's called urban renewal. So the idea that certain neighborhoods that um, were making the rest of the community or the cities look bad, that the government would come in and bulldoze over these neighborhoods, displacing families. And if you look down here, um, you notice that it tends to be disproportionately families of color. Um, that were mainly being displaced in most of these communities. Looking again at patterns, where are we seeing circles? Where are we not seeing circles? Think, think back, or if you have two tabs open now on your browser, um, what patterns do we see comparing this base map to the Hulk one that we looked at with mapping inequality? You can put your thoughts in the chat. What are we seeing here in terms of patterns or similarities and differences to the last map we looked at? So Katrina says there are no dots in Utah, unlike the other map. Okay, good one. So maybe Salt Lake didn't have urban renewal going on at the time. Um, Anna said that we're still seeing the clustering on the East Coast. Yep. The circle in Los Angeles isn't as big as some of the other larger cities. Yep, it was much larger on the other one. Good one. Anything uh, else? It, Katrina said it included San Juan. Absolutely. I think a lot of times we tend to forget and not think about Puerto Rico. I think we also, if you look over here, Alaska's showing some uh, in the Anchorage area and others. So, um, you know, a lot of times we, we don't even think about poor Alaska and Hawaii 
because they tend to get put down here on maps for convenience sake and we know that they should be somewhere up there um, geographically. The other thing I do want to point out is using it in this view is in the cartogram, but we also can switch over to a map view, which does change it a little bit. Um, but it's, you know, you, you can toggle back and forth and then also um, you can do what's called the chart view, which is kind of interesting and, and takes a little bit longer to kind of look at, but it shows very quickly, um, you know, everything below this yellow line was families of color and everything above were white families. So look at the, where the majority of the displacement occurred. So Dr. Kenman wanted to point out that the renewal map is projected and the other map is not. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go back out to the map and um, I'm going to type in a city. So Dr. Kimman, you can pick a city now. What city would you like to explore? Dr. Kimman, are you still with us? He's muted. Oh, he's muted. Okay. <laughs> Um, Charlotte, North Carolina. Yes. Okay. All right. So if we go to Charlotte, North Carolina, hopefully. And I'm not as familiar with them. Did I get it? Yeah. Um, I, now I'm not as familiar with Charlotte, North Carolina. I've been through there, but um, uh, so I don't know the neighborhoods the same way that I know the ones in Richmond or the ones in Charlottesville, but um, that's good, right? Because this is how we explore. So these, there's apparently a large sub uh, housing uh, area called the Brooklyn, and they've got that divided into sections. Um, so that looks like a large housing development that was impacted by this urban renewal. So again, if you look down at the bar graphs, very large difference between the families that were displaced, families of color versus um, white families. And then also over here, this first ward area, um, it says that's an area that they still are looking for scholarships. So we are constantly upgrading these maps and updating them. So if a, a person like Dr. Kimman, you know, may have more information, maybe he lived there at one point, or maybe he has images he can contribute to the project. Um, these maps aren't ever finished, really. And I think that's important for us to understand about digital scholarship. Um, so we know that First Ward in Charlotte, North Carolina was apparently part of urban renewal process, but there's not a lot of good data out there yet. So that's an area that we would welcome any assistance on and, and filling in some of those gaps. So, but you can still click on these various sections in the Brooklyn housing and you can see um, compared to other projects in Charlotte, how many families were displaced and how much money was spent in each of those sections. And you and, can again do that. Andy, part. I wanna interrupt you real quickly because okay. as you're looking at these maps, because Ethan Joseph had a really good observation about comparing the two that I think is relevant where he said places, places with a bigger AB percentage in the first map have more white displacement in this map. And that was interesting. Yeah, and there are gonna be a few places where there are white, more white families. I mean, it doesn't happen as, as frequently as we saw when we looked at the, um, at the whole map. So if I click back out of Charlotte and take us back, when we go to the chart, we clearly see overwhelmingly that it was mainly families of color, but there are gonna be a few areas like Augusta, right? Where you're gonna see the families displaced here is a large percentage of white families that were displaced. So it is gonna happen sometimes. Um, and, and it looks like that this area, it says university hospital, medical college. So it looks like perhaps the need for a larger medical uh, facility or maybe a regional uh, facility was greater than whatever type of political or social, um, you know, fallout there would have been from from taking away from from white neighborhoods. It'd be interesting to go back and look at some of these. What was the student's name that made that observation, Ms. Costello? Ethan, Ethan yeah. Joseph. So, so Ethan, if you if you were to go back and compare some of the areas where the, the white families were more displaced than families of color, and then compare those to redlining, were those mainly green and blue neighborhoods? Were those yellow and red neighborhoods? That would be an interesting um, thing to explore as well. Great observations. So again, these maps, um, you know, while we've got a lot of information, a lot of uh, data visualized through these maps, 
there are occasionally like the one that we saw um, in Charlotte, there's still some that we are missing pieces. And that's because we, we aren't able to find documents to back up or help illustrate that. But as these things are uncovered, and that's why I love history so much, um, historians are uncovering new, new information, new scholarship all the time. These Hulk maps sat for decades buried in the um, sources that were not out on public display at the Library of Congress. And it was someone who went in doing research on a different topic who kind of stumbled upon these in the Library of Congress archives and said, oh my gosh, these maps, where have these maps been? I've never seen these before. And, and by him bringing those out into the light and then people like Dr. Finn and the people at the Digital Scholarship Lab at U of R and others digitizing them and making them available to all of us, um, that's how we started talking about redlining and, and looking at now through the, the lens of, of our decade and our generation and our century. Um, and that's, that's why history is always changing. It's not just this set of facts in a textbook that we study. And that's why geography and you taking a class like uh, AP Human Geography or World Geography is really important because you're gonna make those bigger uh, observations through what we like to call geoliteracy. Um, so that's a great observation, Ethan. All right, Ashley has a question. Okay. Um, she said, her question is, could this be considered an impact in the people, uh, the community uh, uh, of color is how she words it. Mm -hmm. um, like most people, most of the houses are probably owned by white people. Can we consider that in the future, still white people will own more properties than property owners in communities of color? I'm not sure I quite understand. So I think what she means is, many of people that are living in these displaced communities don't own these properties, they rent these properties, I think is what she's getting at. And so will it always be that way, I think is what she's asking. And I think someone asked Dr. Finn a similar question. They said, is, is it always gonna be this way? Is, are we always gonna have these racial divides? Are we always gonna have these wealth gaps? And I, I really don't have the definitive answer. All I can say is, gosh, I hope not. Like, I hope that we will, um, there will come a point in our country and in our society that that we will see more equitable um, ownership of land. We will see more equitable um, wages that people will start to not earn wages based on their gender or the color of their skin or where they went to college, but they will see um, wages for the same pay done for the same work. And we know that right now that that's not always the case. Um, we, we talked a little bit about generational wealth and we're gonna get to that in a few minutes. So this question kind of segues us nicely into that. Um, but I think it's gonna be the decisions that you, the students now who become the leaders and the future voters will be making because we know that there need to be changes. We know systemic racism for too long has held families um, back from being able to earn a decent wage or being able to perhaps pull themselves out of impoverished situations. It's not their fault and it's not a situation that they put themselves in or want to be in. It's not for lack of trying. It's because these barriers, these government policies and these systems have been in place for a very, very long time. And they, they go all the way back to, um, you know, times when we had enslaved people. Um, and so looking back through hundreds of years of generational wealth on the part of white families um, and, and the ownership of property in our country, uh, that is something that will take generations to overcome. And maybe the events this summer that we talked about, or we're gonna talk a little bit more about here in a moment, um, I think that your generation will hopefully be the one to start to make that change um, better than my generation or, or maybe the ones who are currently um, slightly younger than me that are in some of those positions of government power and decision-making. But I hope so. My, my answer to that is I really hope so. And I think that's going to be up to your generation to, to make that happen. We're, we're getting started now. And um, I think by creating lessons and scholarship like this, that's how academics like the folks at the Digital Scholarship Lab and like Dr. Finn can contribute. We create this scholarship not because it's fun to create really cool maps. We create this scholarship so that people can learn from it and so people can start to visualize and understand these patterns that have happened in the past and use them to make solutions for the future um, would be my answer to that. That was kind of a long answer. 
That was a great answer. answer uh, we have one, one question. I don't know if you want to take it now, but uh, have there been any efforts to compare Sanborn, map, Sanborn maps used for insurance to the redlining or the urban renewal maps? Yeah, I think that some of those maps have been used in other um, scholars' work. I We specifically don't have the those maps embedded into this project, but we are working on other projects that I am going to show you in a moment. So that's kind of a good uh, segue for us to continue. We'll hop back to our slides here for a moment. Um, not the Sanborn map specifically, but that's a great idea. And I'm going to put that idea in, in front of our cartographers and our scholars who work at the lab. It may be that they could incorporate that into some of their future work, um, which is why I love working with students like this. Um, so this is the Richmond one. Just you could probably some of you have already toggled there, especially those of you who are logging in from Richmond. Um, but I wanted to kind of bring this, uh, this up because when we looked at the earlier redlining maps, we looked at some of these neighborhoods. And um, so the Carver neighborhood here um, and some of the neighborhoods that are closer to what we now think of as VCU, um, the Broad Street area, some of those projects, we're gonna look at those in a, in a more modern map that we're getting ready to look at again. So I wanna keep that in mind. And one of the neighborhoods that we know during urban renewal that was bulldozed through is Jackson Ward. So here is a smaller inset map. And we'll look at this again in a moment. This is when the highways came through. And so during this period of urban renewal, um, and you can see a really clear image here, this is when they were building Interstate 95 and 64, where they converge here. Um, and so those of you who are in Chesterfield or Henrico or Richmond City schools, you've probably all traveled on this road many times. And maybe what you didn't understand was when those roads were built um, in the uh, interest of urban renewal, um, whole neighborhoods and communities like Jackson Ward were literally cut in half. So part of Jackson Ward neighborhood was over here and part of it was down here, south of 95. And they literally just came and cut those communities, which were communities, African-American communities, largely, um, literally just cut them in half. So now they've disconnected people live on one side and work in the other, or people depended on shopping or worshiping or own businesses. And now they've made it very difficult, especially people taking public transportation to get from one side of the neighborhood or the community to the other. Um, if you're a Virginia student, I know we have a few students from other states, but if you're a Virginia student, um, you've studied Maggie Walker back when you were in fourth or fifth grade. And uh, again, I, my bias is for or against multiple choice tests and high stakes tests are not the subject of today's talk, but it is a concern of mine that, that we tend to isolate facts and to memorize things just to pass a test without really looking fully and completely at the historical or geographic significance of things sometimes. And Maggie Walker is a significant figure, not just because she opened a bank, which is all you have to do to memorize to pass your Virginia Studies SOL when you were a little kid, but more importantly, she was kind of the heart of the Jackson Ward community. Her house, some of you might have taken a field trip there, walk past it. Her house, house is now um, part of the National Park Service's uh, historic sites, and you can take a tour there. Um, but there are other very significant buildings in the Jackson Ward neighborhood, Ebenezer Baptist Church and the 1st Battalion Armory, which now um, has been turned into a Black History Museum. Um, these are all buildings and images of places that were um, places where the community gathered and where a lot of the civic and civil rights work was done and a lot of the community organizing was done. And to just rip that community in half and tear it apart um, really led to the downfall of some parts of that community and made it difficult for businesses um, and people that owned homes to continue to keep up their properties. And so, you know, if your job's on the other side of this highway and they've now bulldozed through your neighborhood, it's difficult for you to get there and public transportation may or may not get you there. Um, again, it was one more barrier that was thrown in front of these folks. Um, and so you can go back later, all of these images and the information I've linked in the presenter notes for you to do more, more research, but there are hundreds of neighborhoods like Jackson Ward that were impacted um, by this urban renewal, which was supposed to make things better for the city, well, better for which people? You know, better for the people who were already doing pretty well and wealthy and continue to get wealthier as a result of the highway system, because it surely was not better for some of the people living in Jackson Ward and other neighborhoods that were, were now ripped apart.
or bulldozed over. And many of those people were displaced and had nowhere affordable to go. And so if you look at our homeless problem in Richmond, you know, we didn't really start to have lots of what we would nowadays call homeless people until after the 50s and 60s. You know, homelessness was not as big of, and we've always had it, but if you look, we've got a much larger homeless problem in some of our major cities. And a lot of that came as a result of a lack of affordable housing and people being displaced with nowhere else to go. Are there any comments from that in the chat, Ms. Costello? No, not right now. So some of you probably saw a movie that came out a few years ago called The Green Book. And I was very excited when I first heard that they were making that movie until I saw it. And while it's an entertaining story, it really had nothing to do with The Green Book. So I felt like it was a huge missed opportunity. But um, if you find The Green Book, then and it has been digitized, there are several versions. It was a book that was created. Um, it was called The Negro Motorist Handbook. And what it did was it, it showed families of color as they were traveling throughout the South safe places where they could stop and get gas and get a meal and stay in a hotel where they would not be harassed or um, unwelcome. And Jackson Ward, if you look at old copies of the Green Book, there were several places in the Jackson Ward neighborhood that were listed for Richmond, Virginia in the Green Book. And some of those are no longer there because the, fil the buildings fell in disrepair. Um, but many of them are still there. And so that would be another interesting thing would be to map out or look at places that were in the green book during this time around, right around the same time as the Hulk maps and this urban renewal period, um, and then mapping out what, what buildings are still there and how are they being used? Are they used for public purposes? Are they privately owned? Um, you know, Is it still a church? Is it still an armory? Is it still someone's home? Um, is another project that you might wanna look into. So we looked at the racial covenants with the Monument Avenue Park, and we talked about how the offensive language that was included in both the scan documents from the Hulk maps and also uh, this idea of racial covenants. But I don't want you guys to think that that is all something that was in the past or in the olden days. So I wanted to make sure that you had um, access to some of the documents, and this is touching a little bit on some of your civics that you took when you're middle school and government that some of you are taking or will be taking before you graduate from high school. But I think it's important that we understand that to make changes in our communities, like some of you were asking, is it always going to be this way? Part of that is legislative. And that's why your civics classes and your government classes are just as important as your history classes and just as important as your geography classes because all of those put together, those pieces are gonna make you a better citizen and, and a homeowner and a consumer. So um, Article 34 is part of the Realtors Code of Ethics. So you think about that marketing that we looked at, those ads for Monument Park in the previous slide. Um, Realtors have a handbook uh, that is called their Code of Ethics and it is updated periodically, um, if not every year. And especially as new laws pertaining to real estate um, are updated. Uh, I know for sure they're getting an update this year, and we'll talk about that in a while. But between 1924 and 1950, in the code of ethics that realtors were by law supposed to uphold as part of their training and their licensing to be allowed to sell and facilitate the purchasing of homes and buildings, um, it read if you look up here in this square, a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality or any individuals whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. This was their code of ethics. They were basically being told not to allow people of any race or nationality. And we see that word detrimental. If you go back to those scan documents on the Hulk maps, that word detrimental was used over and over and over again for the red and yellow neighborhoods. And this was literally what they called ethics. So ethics are supposed to be the moral values types judgments that we use. And I don't know if you've had uh, an ethics class yet in your high school career. Many of us don't, think counter that type of a class till we get to college or um, maybe your social sociology or psychology classes might touch on it. But um, to me, that's not very ethical. 
Excuse me. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> Take a moment to look at, um, excuse me. Take a moment to look at the slide and, <coughs> and read some of the, um, the documents. What are you noticing about some of these um, court cases or other documents that you see on the screen? And you can put it in the chat. So one of the court cases that the Supreme Court ruled on towards the end of when this particular version of the Code of Ethics was uh, still in law or part of the document was where they used the 14th Amendment to kind of challenge these real estate practices. So if you look at the area here in the red bracket, um, you'll notice that Article 34 in 1955, so pay attention to the dates. This is the Code of Ethics up till 1950 when the book was reviewed. <coughs> this is the court case of the Shelley family that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And you can look at the links in the presenter notes and see a little bit more about it. But this was a family in Missouri that kind of challenged the urban renewal and challenged this idea of fair housing practices. Um, and when they looked at the court decided that the 14th amendment would prevent realtors and developers from holding families back um, based on race. And so as a result of that, they had to reword the realtors uh, code of ethics. And so what used to be called article 34 now became Article 5, but if you look down here, basically, even though the Supreme Court said you need to stop these practices as realtors and developers, basically the um, wording of the Code of Ethics stayed almost the same. All they did was remove the word race, but they still kept the idea of it there where they said they should not be instrumental in introducing a neighborhood, a character of property or use that will be detrimental. They took the word race out because they had to, but leaving that phrase in there, people still continue to interpret that as not letting the wrong kind of people move into your neighborhood. And so later on, the Fair Housing Act 1968, and as you study civil rights, if you're in AP US history or US history course, um, the Fair Housing Act in 1968, basically it expands on this language. It's not just by looking at, at color, but also at gender, race, disability, nation of origin. You know, we have, we are a nation of immigrants. Um, religion is added into that language and also family status. At that time in 1968, family status was looking at things like single family because a lot at that time, divorce was more common than it was maybe in the 20s, 30s, 40s, or early 50s. And so not um, discriminating against someone because they were not married or not discriminating against someone because they happened to worship a certain religion. So they expanded the language, not just uh, the color of your skin, but race, but also these other areas of protected citizens. And that still wasn't enough. So if you look, um, this article from 2015, this was from the Richmond Times-Dispatch and they had a public forum on housing and education and some of the um, local policies. And I'm only using Richmond to illustrate this because we know this goes on in communities across the country. But um, this was a, a director of a student-based organization that supports students. Uh, his name is Ted Groves. And he talked about educational research showing that students who live in 
poverty, students who live in neighborhoods that do not have um, the same access to grocery stores or access to health care or access to clean drinking water or, um, you know, places for kids to play safely outside. They know that this is making a great impact on those children's reading and writing and, and school success. But the thing that I was shocked to discover as I was preparing for a similar presentation as this was this article down here, Virginia House Bill 788. So this is our Virginia General Assembly. For those of you not tuning in from Virginia, I know we have a few people from other states that tuned in last week and possibly today. Um, I was shocked to discover that it was not until July 1st of this year, meaning just three or four months ago, here in the state of Virginia, that racial covenants, like the ones that we saw on those previous slides, were finally, again, this is February, the General Assembly approved this, the law went into effect July 1st of this year, stating that Virginia joins only a handful of states, meaning not all other states have even done this yet, that ban discriminatory housing restrictions referred to as racial covenants that were until recently still presented to homeowners in 2020. Guys, 2020 isn't over till the end of this month. So up until this year, the second half of this year, people going to buy a home that was built, basically many homes before 1968 that had some of that language in the contract, those racial covenants, saying that you cannot resell this property to people from this nationality or this race. They, are, they just now finally made them take that language out of those housing contracts. So think about that for a minute. If you bought a house before July of this year that was built in the 20s or the 30s or 40s or earlier, you would go to a closing meeting when your parents bought your house, if you live in an older house those of you that live in a house that were, was built during that time, they may have gone and sat in a meeting where they signed papers to purchase their home. And then at some point during that meeting, they would say, and most realtors felt uncomfortable. They would say, I'm really sorry, but by law I'm required to show you that there's a sentence here in your housing contract that says you can never sell this house to certain people. But don't worry, we don't enforce that anymore. We don't enforce that because of this law down here from 1968. And yet they were still required to keep that in the housing contract. And it was still part of you purchasing that home. So think about that for a minute. And again, Virginia is only a handful of states that has finally taken this out of those housing contracts. So I'd like to know the students thoughts on that. We definitely got a wow from the chat box. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I, mean I, I literally, the day that I found this, and again, I was looking for something else related to this, and I stumbled on that article. And if you click in the presenter notes, the, the family that um, kind of was the, the ones behind spearheading House Bill 788, um, there were two gentlemen who were buying a home together. They wanted to start a family. And um, same-sex unions have been legal in Virginia for a few years now, and they were buying a piece of property in a kind of a gentrified neighborhood, a neighborhood that previously may have been in the red or yellow lined areas, but because of urban renewal has, um, that we've seen certain neighborhoods that are now uh, considered the, the better places where they've gone in and, and changed the neighborhood and upgraded many of the homes in that neighborhood. And now the, the selling prices are much higher. And when they went to their closing meeting, they are presented with one of these racial covenants. And having been discriminated against themselves um, for being in a same-sex union, they were like, I'm not buying a house with language because discrimination is discrimination. And so they refused to purchase the home. And then they started a nonprofit organization that um, fought to get this bill passed. And so we see that these, fair, these unfair housing practices for generations, we're still impacting families today. 
as recently, and this was about, a, it took them about a year and a half, almost two years uh, to lobby and successfully get this bill passed. And think about if we're only a handful of states, what are families of color? What are families um, with same-sex unions experiencing having this type of restrictions? And we know that this sort of discrimination still goes on in 2020. So again, it's gonna be your generation that's gonna to have to continue to push and fight for fair housing policies and better laws like this family did with House Bill 788. Any other thoughts in the chat, Ms. Um, Estella? No, just the, it's unbelievable that it took so long for us to get here. Yeah, absolutely. Are we doing okay on time? Do you have until we're, 11, correct? We're at 11 o'clock, we're at 11 o'clock. Okay, so we still got a little bit of time. Correct, yeah. right? Okay. Um, so this is our newest map. Uh, this was released towards the end of the summer, and it is also part of the um, Digital Scholarship Labs American Panorama um, website, and you should have all the links there to get out to this map. And what we've done is we've taken our original mapping inequality projects, uh, and so you see here on the left, we've still got the original scanned Hulk maps, and over here on the right, um, we have geo-rectified and we've overlaid those onto the modern maps, um, not just for Richmond, but for other cities. And then we've got kind of this strange, unusual um, diagram here in the middle. So I'm going to go out to the live site. Um, let me see what I have to do to get back out there. Oop. Sorry about that. Um, let me see. Yeah, I think it is going to force me to go back out this way. Um, so I'm going to take us out to American Panorama so that you can look at the newest map, which is the one that you see here, not even passed. And so what we've done is we've taken the redlining map, the mapping inequality project that you saw, and um, we've now overlaid it on something called the Social Vulnerability Index. And so it's not just for Richmond. We've actually done this, and there's some great um, You'll want to take some time to go back and explore kind of the, the how to's in more detail, um, but it explains how to read this graph. So basically what we've taken is the areas that were in the green, the blue, the yellow, and the red, and now we're updating it to look um, at various social factors, including healthcare and um, income level, and how is that impacting the, the value or the quality of life of people living in those areas today? And so we're going to use that to kind of look at some patterns. Um, and if you scroll down, you were going to see um, these are the names of all the cities that were in the original mapping inequality project. So you see here in Virginia, Lynchburg, Newport News, which Dr. Finn talked about last week, and Norfolk, um, Richmond, which we've looked at today, and also um, Roanoke, Virginia. So those are the areas in Virginia specifically that were included in the original redlining maps that the Homeowners Loan Corporation put out. And so you saw those on mapping equality. These, all of these cities, um, if we go back to North Carolina, Dr. Um, Kim and wanted to look at Charlotte and Kylie wanted to look in Michigan at Detroit, we could really pick any city. I'm gonna start with Richmond just because I'm more familiar with it, but you can pick any city that you want to explore. So we've got the original maps over here and we've got Richmond. I'm gonna make the map a little bit bigger so we can see. Um, so if you notice over here, for example, in the Hulk maps, this area here, which those of you from Richmond, it's known as the fan. Um, at the time when the Hulk maps were made, it was yellow. It was considered on the decline. Um, it was not the most desirable place to live. But if you look now over here on the right, it would be what you would think if we had these same color rating systems, it would now be considered very much in the green. And that's because of what we talked about gentrification. Um, and so some of you may or may not have started talking in your, if you're logging in from an AP human geography course, maybe your teacher hasn't taught gentrification yet, uh, or maybe they have because we all kind of study things in different orders, depending on what uh, class we're logging in from. But this idea of taking neighborhoods that were maybe on the decline, maybe the buildings weren't being kept up, maybe the neighborhoods weren't being kept up, and then people with some money and an interest in owning an older home or fixing up a home, um, you guys have seen this explosion of TV shows where people go in and flip houses, and that's kind of a thing now. Um, but many neighborhoods it, that were formerly redlined or in the yellow, like in the Fan or Church Hill of, in Richmond, Virginia, um, have had this gentrification occur 
which means that even more families that lived in that area are now displaced, not able to afford to keep up and make those improvements to their home. And so eventually they are kind of forced out and then there may or may not be affordable options on where they can move. Um, and so what we're seeing is as we're going through, you can select you know, these, these green neighborhoods, what we used to call the near West End. And we know that those of you logging in from Richmond, the suburbs, the, out, the counties, um, would, if we were to grade those neighborhoods, they would certainly be what would be considered in the green. So a lot of those neighborhoods have gotten even more higher in value um, compared now to what they were in the yellow. Um, some of those that were in the, the red or yellow in the past, there's a neighborhood right there. Um, that's what we now call the museum district uh, over by the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts or the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. And so this is now considered like very expensive property and a very lovely place to live, but um, it also has displaced other families. And so looking at this um, social vulnerability index, um, if you click on one of those neighborhoods and I'm just gonna pick, um, let me go ahead and pick this one. You can click on any neighborhood on the map and basically up here, you'll see the data from those original Hulk maps. Okay, and you can see that 95% of that map uh, of the people living in there at that time were what the, back then they termed Negro. Um, and you can explore the whole, it'll take you back to mapping inequality and it'll, you can explore all the whole scan document and all that. But if you look now, this gives you um, today's data, what they call the social vulnerability index. And so it shows you what percentage of families living there now are minority. It shows you what their life expectancy is. It shows the median age. Is this an aging population? There are a lot of older people there who've owned these homes or lived in these homes for a very long time or have young families moved in and flipped these houses or fixed them up um, or made this the new hip trendy neighborhoods to move into. And when that happens, it, is that pushing other people out? So for example, you notice in this area, um, it, there are very few people over the age of 65, only 30 some percent now. So it is, it is a, an area where there are more younger people moving in, but you also look at the poverty. And so there are higher rates of poverty in some of these neighborhoods. Um, and then you look at health situations, like how many people have asthma, cancer, diabetes, blood pressure issues. So a myriad of different um, ways that living in a neighborhood that is perhaps not taken care of or not kept up can impact your, um, your, your kids' chances in life. You know, if you're born into a certain neighborhood, uh, there's another map called the Opportunity Atlas uh, that I think I also linked into the presenter notes, where it basically says in many cases for a kid, depending on where you are born, it can greatly predict, will you be incarcerated in the future? Will you have major health problems? Um, will you be successful? And so these are all factors that we can look at literally neighborhood by neighborhood using this new tool, which is kind of exciting um, scholarship, I think, that you could spend weeks exploring this, uh, this one map and comparing it to the other two that we looked at. So are there any thoughts on that, Ms. Costello? I don't wanna to go too fast. I wanna give them lots of chances to ask questions. Right now, I don't see anything in the chat. If anybody has any questions or, um please feel free to pop them in or just comments and observations to you guys. Anything yeah, you want to share? You guys have had great questions. Um, so I, I do want to show how these, um, all of this scholarship, all these maps uh, are impacting what we're going to do moving towards the future. So this was a great article that came out a couple of years ago where a realtor, and this was on Zillow, which for those of you uh, who probably don't look at Zillow because you're not kids and you can't own a house yet, but um, Zillow is a real estate website that basically um, where families that are looking to move to a certain place can look for houses in that neighborhood and they can pull up all kinds of data about that neighborhood when they're trying to make informed choices about what is probably the most important purchase that most people make, which is investing in a home or, or piece of property. So Zillow went back through the formerly red line neighborhoods to look similar to what we saw in the last map that I just shared with you, where are those neighborhoods now? And um, when we talked about generational wealth, how families that were living in green and blue neighborhoods in the 20s, 30s and 40s, pass these properties along to their children and their grandchildren. Um, where are those properties now? So people that were living in green and blue neighborhoods have seen, especially in the green neighborhoods, have seen tremendous 
gains. And this is where we, we have that generational wealth. You know, you inherit a home and it was worth 200,000 and now it's over half a million dollars in value. Um, but the, we see that the families live in the red and yellow, there's been very little appreciation compared to cost of living. And so doing this study, um, and, and the only rare occasions where that's not true are places like Haverhill, Massachusetts, where we've seen things like gentrification. But that is very few and far between compared to the majority of the places that we look at on those whole red line maps. So that's something to think about, um, the long-term real estate outlook for that. Um, and then I know Dr. Finn mentioned this map, um, the Virginia Geographic Alliance. We have scholars who are working with Jeremy Hoffman from the Science Museum of Virginia. I know Dr. Mike Allen down at ODU is working on the Norfolk part of this heat map study, but this was a, a tremendous piece of scholarship in the New York Times that was published this summer. And you should have a link to it in your presenter notes um, where they looked at the impact of urban heat islands. And if you think back to those racial covenant ads for Monument Park that we looked at earlier, if you want to flip back in your slides, uh, one of the selling points that I had in those red brackets for you to look at mentioned that they invested in nice sidewalks and lots of shade trees, right? Well, some of the housing developments that we looked at, um, especially the neighborhoods that were bulldozed through um, and separated during urban renewal did not have the shade trees and did not have parks and recreation areas built into the development. And so just as Dr. Finn talked about in Newport News, how they are now tearing some of those projects down and putting in mixed income housing as part of the, hopefully the solution moving forward, um, we know that there are many communities across the country that are just not there yet, are not able to or not willing to depending on who are making the policies. So the impact, if you look, and, and Dr. Kimmon mentioned he was tuning in from Farmville near the Moton School, the Moton Museum. So if you look here in Farmville, comparing it to Ashland, which is north of the city of Richmond to the city of Richmond, you can see that Richmond, as they say, is warming up much faster than its rural neighbors. So if you lived in Dr. Kinman's neighborhood, um, where I have been in that, that area, Farmville, my sister happens to live there. Um, it's a nice, quiet, small college town. It's got beautiful parks. There's actually a, a lovely trail there that you can walk along with lots of shade trees. Um, but if you're looking in the city of Richmond in certain neighborhoods, you don't have that. And so we're seeing these areas heat up, sweltering. And many of the communities that are experiencing these heat islands are also families where people do not have central air conditioning. They may or may not even have a window air conditioning unit. Um, they may or may not have landlords who are willing to upgrade and maintain these systems. And so we find a lot of people with those persistent health conditions that we saw on the not even past map that we just looked at are living in these neighborhoods where especially in the summer, they are very vulnerable. And so if you look at medical records, how many people are having heart attacks, heat stroke, um, severe medical consequences, many of them are living in these neighborhoods. And Dr. Hoffman and others are doing these studies of urban heat islands um, to try and show the impact, which is directly related back to those formerly redlined neighborhoods. Um, and this next one, this is just a zoom in um, showing some of those neighborhoods. So here are some of those green neighborhoods that we looked at in Richmond, the Fan District, um, Belmont, James River Park, lots of beautiful green spaces. And then you look here on the map, here are those same green neighborhoods. But then we're looking at places, you know, here that were formerly redlined, even the fan, which has now been regentrified, and it's still got some issues when it looks um, at that, although it's, it's not as bad as some of these areas like Jackson Ward that we looked at on the urban renewal map. So something for us to think about again, as we're making policy decisions, um, as we are buying and selling, you will at some point, you know, perhaps choose to purchase a home um, in, your, in your future. Uh, these are all things that you wanna consider. You know, when I'm buying a home, who used to live here or who's the previous owner or what exactly am I getting myself into? And is by buying a home in this neighborhood, keeping someone else out? right? We're all, we're all consumers, we're all making these decisions, but are we also investing when we go to vote on things like 
am I going to take a tax increase so that we can plant more trees so that people living in this part of the city, maybe I live over here, we've got lots of nice shade trees, but I want the kids and the families living in these neighborhoods to have a park or a green space or access to a good grocery store. Those things, you know, developmentally are going to cost money and, and as voters and taxpayers, those are decisions you're going to be part of very soon the next few years. So we might want to think about those. Any questions or thoughts coming in the chat, Ms. Costello? Nope, nothing. So these maps, uh, these next couple of maps, I think really illustrate well, um, this is a map taken from the same uh, scholarship that was used for the Niven Pass. This is showing poor healthcare across the country. So again, I don't wanna just focus on Richmond or Newport News. These are, um, this is poor healthcare in general from 2016, a study that was done. And you notice that many of the areas in the darker red that have poor health mean people that don't have access to either a decent medical facility or they don't have they can't afford or have access to health care. And so these areas that are red, you notice if you compare them to our redlining map are hitting in a lot of the same places um, across the country. These are uh, also comparing people that are in what is considered below the poverty level from 2016, which was the last study. And so again, these areas in the South where there was a lot of redlining we know going on, parts of Texas, parts of up here near the Four Corners, um, but the, the Dakotas, we didn't have a lot of redlining maps because the population was smaller, but now we've got a lot of families living in this part of the country that are considered below the poverty level. And if you look for patterns, these were COVID cases in April. This map was made by our folks at the Digital Scholarship Lab that made mapping inequality and not even passed. Um, these were the COVID cases very early on in the pandemic. And then this is from August. This is COVID cases across the country as of August. And we know, those of you who've been watching the news, We've had our largest surge here in the last two or three weeks since Thanksgiving. And so if we were to recreate this map again, and there are lots of maps every day in your newspaper and online, this map would be even more dark pink or purple. Dr. Kimman points out that the Native American reservations show up Absolutely. in the West. And that's another population that was not considered in the Hulk maps originally as much. But we know, especially this part of the country where there are a lot of American uh, Indians were forced off of their land. I mean, we've got Native Americans living everywhere in the United States, of course, but there are large populations because of the forced uh, migration of Native Americans um, that are living in this area. And that's exactly what you're seeing here in the dark purple. So thank you for pointing that out, Dr. Kimman. So these maps come from a new uh, book and a new piece of scholarship. Uh, that was put out by University of Richmond. Um, Dr. Ed Ayers is our director. Some of you may know Dr. Ayers is a historian. Um, he used to be president of U of R and that's who I work with. And he started the Digital Scholarship Lab and he started New American History because he wants students like you to think about and have access to the best research and the best visualizations and the best maps to try and become the problem solvers of the future. Um, and we know that in, in addition to dealing with the COVID pandemic this summer, um, a lot of people on the news are also talking about the pandemic of systemic racism. Um, I'm not really sure I, I, I like calling that a pandemic. I think pandemic implies that we're gonna find a, a vaccine and we're gonna cure it. Um, and I think it's gonna take a lot more than that because we are looking at over 400 years of racism. And that's another conversation. And I hope in this speaker series, we may be able to invite Dr. Ayers to come and talk more specifically to that. But this is an image that was taken in June um, around uh, the time when some of the um, monuments on Monument Avenue here in Virginia, but also Confederate monuments across the country were um, being torn down or some people call it vandalism. Other people call it, um, it's actually been named now as the number one piece of protest art in the country by the New York Times last month. But this was a, a essay that Dr. Ayers produced that talks about a lot of these um, mapping inequality and not even past and a lot of the other topics that we've been exploring today, which is part of this bigger problem of systemic racism that we all see. And after Mr. Floyd's murder this summer um, and others, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, th this, these are not the first people and they unfortunately have not even since that time uh, been the last to be victims of um, 
unfair justice and, and brutality at the hands of people that we trust to protect and serve us on a daily basis and includes our police officers and our lawmakers. And, um, you know, I have police officers and military people in my own family. And these are questions that we are all grappling with. And we are all needing to go back and look at, am I a part of the problem? And our choices that I make and our decisions that I make and our things that I say, part of this problem. Um, and am I holding back because I'm successful, perhaps I'm making it so someone else is not, or because I can afford to buy a house in this neighborhood, am I making it more difficult for people that, that are struggling to find affordable housing? Um, and I think that we're all kind of in this reflective period as a nation, and I'm hoping that by bringing things like this to light, that um, people who are currently in power, but more importantly, people who will be in power and making the decisions in the future, which again is you, and it may sound like I keep saying that over and over again, but that is really the biggest takeaway I want you to take from this talk is um, it's we're not going to fix this problem overnight. Mapping inequality, uh, you know, and, and these other scholarship projects um, are going to be the tools that you will use to help solve these problems. And you will develop new scholarship, some of you that go into the field of history or geography or GIS or um, other related fields, urban planning, you're going to have to be part of the solution for this. So I'd love it if you took time to go back and read this article on your own, if you're interested in kind of the historical background of how we got where we are today. I think this is a good starting off place for it. I also want to show you Bunk. Uh, the Bunk website is uh, part of New American History and it is, uh, I call it a connection engine. Um, and you have a link out there to bunkhistory.org. And basically what Bunk does is it allows you to um, uh, I'm going to go back out to the site. It allows you to con make connections. And so if you're studying something in your geography courses or your history courses, um, this is our bunk homepage. And I know we've only got about eight minutes left. Um, but Miss Costello, will you pick an article that you would like to explore? And this changes sometimes uh, hourly. So what you see on the bunk homepage now may not be there in a few hours. But is there something here that you are interested in exploring, Miss? Costello. I always love a good grave site. So I immediately was drawn to New Orleans vanishing. I knew you were going to pick that. <laughs> and I have been to a New Orleans cemetery. And I have to say, I am a scaredy cat. And it is one of the creepiest places I've ever been. But the idea behind Bunk is that we excerpt uh, articles from newspapers, magazines, new scholarship, and then we help connect it to other um, thoughts and ideas. So you, here's the article on the vanishing graves in New Orleans and how these older cemeteries are almost a capacity. Where are we going to continue to bury people? We're running out of space. Um, you can look here and you see these icons. So if you want to find something that uh, has to do with the same core idea, you can explore through this view connections. And so here's the Triangle Shirtwaist Memorial. We have a learning resource in our, on our website uh, that actually explores Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, um, but this idea of memorialization. Uh, so if I were to click on the tag, then it tells me, oh, wow, we have 266 items on this topic of memorialization. And so if I were to scroll through here, it talks about Confederate monuments and it talks about military monuments and it talks about internment camps, all these different related topics. So if we go back out to Bunk, you can also search. So I'm going to type in redlining. And so you'll see all of our maps are embedded into the um, Bunk ecosystem, as we like to call it. So if we go to that last map that we looked at, not even passed with the social vulnerability index, then we see, OK, we've got other articles here, at least 12 that connect out to that. But you could also look at what was going on at the same time period. And so here's an article about the 1918 flu pandemic. There's our friend Maggie Walker. Um, again, in fourth and fifth grade, all you have to know is she started a bank, but she did so much more. She actually started a Black hospital to care for people of color because they were not receiving the same level of care during the 1918 flu pandemic. So if you look now at those COVID maps that we looked at from March through August, and see that people of color, indigenous populations, African-Americans, Latinx populations have been hit much harder with COVID because of lack of medical care with pre-existing conditions. Um, then looking back at in 1918, how Maggie Walker was part of the solution to that, 
who's making those decisions now? What are we going to do to make sure that the families that are living in areas that are most hit by COVID are receiving the care they need and that moving forward, because there will be other pandemics, you know, we're hopefully close to getting a vaccine now. Hopefully many of us will be able to return to school, uh, if not this year, hopefully next year when more people have been vaccinated. But let's look at historically, um, you know, we're kind of making some of the same mistakes that they made back in 1918. What is your generation going to do when the next pandemic hits? Hopefully not anytime soon, but we know that it will happen historically because there's always new germs and new viruses coming out. What are we going to do to ensure that we're not in the same situation? So you can look at these connections. You can go through and look at the tags. So bunk is another really useful tool. Look at structural racism. 309 pieces of scholarship that you could could look at. And it's not just in Virginia. Here's an article about racist history of Portland. And guess what it links right back to, that redlining map that we looked at today. So this is a really valuable tool for you guys to um, use if you're working on a National History Day project or you're just doing your own scholarship. Um, I, I do want to touch base in the last few minutes that we have. So Jackson Ward, that neighborhood that was literally cut in half because of urban renewal, there we see Highway 95. Um, there have been efforts in the last few years to revitalize Jackson Ward. And so a lot of the shops and restaurants and businesses here in the plaza, uh, they've actually built a statue honoring Maggie Walker for the contribution she made to um, this neighborhood in the past. And so we do see some places that were informally redlined neighborhoods going through gentrification, but at, at what expense? Now, um, many families that used to live in that area can no longer afford to live in that area. So this idea that Dr. Finn talked about last week about mixed um, use, you know, having shops and restaurants and housing, but also mixed income, making sure that it's not turning into another have and have nots neighborhood, like we've seen with places like Church Hill and the Museum District and the Fan in the past or other similar communities across the country. So I don't want it to all seem doom and gloom. Looking ahead, I want to give you guys some things to think about and let you know that there are already things uh, in the queue, so to speak, that are coming um, that will hopefully break some of these patterns. So um, for those of you living in Richmond, in December, I was very uh, excited to attend the unveiling of a new statue outside the Museum of History and Culture. Um, and the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, this is actually in, in front of the Museum of Fine Arts, but it's right next to what used to be the daughter, or rather is the Daughters of the Confederacy headquarters. And on the other side of that is our State Historical Society, which has more recently been renamed the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. So if you have not seen rumors of war, and if you do live in Virginia, or if you live in another state, I urge you to come and see this. This is a statue that was two blocks away from the Stonewall Jackson statue, which has now been removed in Richmond, Virginia. But if you look at, the, at other Confederate statues like the Lee statue, and this is a more recent picture with the graffiti from as a result of the protests. Um, if you look at, it portrays an African-American young man on a hoodie with ripped jeans and boots and, and dreadlocks. And he's on a horse very similar to some of the Confederate monuments that we've seen across the country. And this is a, a very, very significant artist, Kahindi Wiley. If you're not familiar with his work, uh, he did the Obama family portraits for the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and he came to do a show here in Virginia at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond. And he had to drive down Monument Avenue coming from the airport to get to the museum. He drove past Monument Avenue at the time when the monuments were still up. They've all been removed now, except for the Lee statue. And he got this idea like, wow, people of color that have to drive through this neighborhood have to look at those statues as a permanent reminder every day of what enslaved Africans, what their ancestors had to go through. Like that must be really painful for them to have to every day look at this on their way to work or on their way to school. And so he imagined like, what if we create this statue as a kind of a counter argument to that? So it's a very powerful piece of work. Um, around the Lee statue, and I know Dr. Kim has visited this area several times. These are pictures that I took this summer. Um, it's actually been a reclaimed space. So we think about public spaces and where this used to be a place that was hurtful and a, and a place that was very painful has now been embraced as a community center and a place where there's a community garden that you can get information on voting. You can get information on where you can get free healthcare, where you can get a COVID test. 
Um, they are collecting food and clothing for the homeless. And so we've now kind of reclaimed this space and where the Confederate monuments were and turned it into a place where the community can come together to try and solve some of these problems. Um, the statue of Lee is still up for debate. Dr. Ayers, who I mentioned earlier, who leads New American History, has testified in two federal court cases, um, which are both now under appeal and will probably could even go up to the Supreme Court on removing the Lee statue. But the statue of Robert E. Lee that used to be in the United States Capitol in Washington, DC, the governor did have that removed. And so now in the next few weeks, uh, or certainly by January, Dr. Ayers is on the commission to decide what statue is going to replace Robert E. Lee in the United States Capitol. People come from all over the world to visit our United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. And when they came, every state has two statues. One of them is George Washington. And some people have even talked about because he held enslaved Africans in bondage, should he be replaced? Right now, the decision has been to leave George Washington knowing that while he was a, a slave owner, he also was our first president. Um, some people are, are really kind of grappling with leaving that one there as well. But for now, we know that the Lee statue is removed. Who's gonna replace it? So students like you were given an opportunity in October and November to submit your ideas. I know that Barbara Johns, who Dr. Kinman mentioned was recommended. Some people have talked about Ona Judge, who was a slave that was owned by George Washington, who escaped and for the rest of her life was on the run. And George Washington went to extreme measures to try and recapture her. Um, some people said it'd be very ironic to have her statue permanently standing next to George Washington in the state in the US Capitol. Um, others have recommended Matoica. Some of you know her as Pocahontas, an indigenous woman. Um, but there've been lots of people recommended and, and George Marshall, who was a military um, uh, historic figure, lots of people have been recommended. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see who will represent us here in Virginia. And then other states are now looking at, well, who's representing us? And there may be other states that remove that monument. Um, and I'm gonna end with, and I know we're out of time, um, African-American history standards were revised um, in the past year. And all of your state standards will be revised starting in January for all history and social science courses. You are students, you have a voice, you will be given an opportunity for public comment. And I hope that you will, and your teachers will keep an eye between January and the end of the school year on what the SOLs, what, what are we gonna study in Virginia? Whose narratives are we gonna tell? Are we gonna tell a more honest and complete narrative? And I hope so. And I hope that you will be part of that process. And that's kind of where I'm gonna end today. Um, Ms. Costello, uh, all of these layers are now in ArcGIS for those of you who like to make your own maps. I'm happy to take questions at the end. I know we've run a couple of minutes over time because I talked too much, but are there any final thoughts or questions from the students? Um, we were just getting some thank yous, but I did want to point out that there is a link that I just dropped for the survey. If all of you would please, please fill that out for us. Thank to you. I, help I us improve that. that. Yep, I've got that here on the. Um, yeah, guys, we, I read all of the ones that those of you who participated last week, and they really helped me in deciding what to leave in and what to leave out on this presentation. We really, really want um, your input. We want these to be useful sessions for you. We want it to be useful for the teachers, but I especially want it to be useful for the students. Um, that's why we created the speaker series. We want to continue it. Um, that first slide, I had a link. If you want to be kept on kind of the mailing list, um, anyone who attended last week or this week, we will invite you to whatever we put out January, February, and March in terms of new speakers. But a little survey um, that's on that first slide, this is telling us how today went. I need to know if this was useful to you. I need to know if your teachers have questions or if you have questions. Um, my email was on that first slide. You can email me directly. Some of you did email me last week and I loved getting your feedback, but filling out this survey, I will share this with all of our Virginia Geographic Alliance and New American History folks and Dr. Finn at Christopher Newport. And it really helps us decide on what we still need to clarify for you um, and what types of speakers you would like to see in here. So please do this, this evaluation, this survey for us because Ms. Costello and I will look at that uh, and Dr. Kim and Dr. Finn and it'll help us decide moving forward. Um, I appreciate your time today. I hope this was useful and valuable to you and I hope we can bring you more sessions like this. 
This video will be on our YouTube channel, the New American History YouTube channel, um, as is Dr. Finn's talk from last week has already been up there for about a week now. Um, please visit that and let us know what we can do to help you as you pursue these topics. And I thank you for your time. I'm going to save that chat so I can read it later. Um, if there's nothing else, I guess we are ready to sign off, Ms. Rawson, if there are any more questions. Thank you so much for your kind uh, thank yous, everybody.